So our um, next presentation is about um, a fun vacation that many of us had in uh, Wuppertal two weeks ago. We all got together and did what was called the JTNM Tested event. And we went through many, many, many pieces of equipment. We checked them for compatibility with the standards. And Yevgen Kostyukevich from the uh, European Broadcasting Union is here to um, give us a presentation on uh, what happened during the testing, what the results were, things like that. So Willem Vermoost um, from the uh, uh, VRT will also be coming up and uh, speaking during this presentation. So i um, glad to have you here and um, looking forward to hearing what you have to say again. So let's get started. So basically, I'm going to talk a little bit about the JTM test and what it was, what did we actually do, uh, what kind of infrastructure we had on site and what kind of early uh, statistical results we got. Uh, some analysis on, on, on top of that of those um, uh, results and also where you can go ahead and download the test plans and also the, um, the actual full-blown matrices with the results. So this is a bullet text just to get you started, get you prepared and pumped for the presentation. <laughs> uh, no, you don't have to read it, of course. And um, basically, in a nutshell, it's just going to tell you what the JTM tested program is, that it is not a certification program. And if someone tells you that they are JTM certified, please come to us and we're going to go and, and have a serious discussion with those people. But essentially, we wanted to give users the snapshot in time of what current state of the of the industry looks like and how the certain devices um, are com compliant with the with the what we what we have in the series of ST2110 standards and also the AMWA and MOS uh, specifications and also some other recommendations from the JTNM with very hard impronounceable abbreviations like the TR1001-1. You will you will read more and, and know more about them in the test plans. So. Uh, so basically, we encourage people to take those task plans and apply them during, for example, your tendering processes when you select equipment, when you validate equipment, and we want to make it repeatable. Um, so essentially, we publish, uh, we, we, we go through three um, uh, fundamental tracks during the testing. We, tr we test the data plane, so basic um, network um, connectivity and media transport. We also test the control plane, things like the um, MWA, NMOS, ISO 4, ISO 5, so all that good stuff related to usability of the implementation. And we also keep track of the cybersecurity landscape. So we do cybersecurity assessment during the um, during the event, and it is actually a mandatory prerequisite that when if you are there, you get scanned, no questions asked. So every single device, every single um, media interface or management interface on network gets scanned, and 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 then we run um, different tests on that and and publish the overall report. So the documents that you uh, can already benefit from are the test plans, of course. So they basically outline what exactly we were testing, how exactly we were testing, what kind of conditions, what kind of prerequisites for the test. So, so there is no really wiggle room like, um, you know, exactly what the conditions were and if a device is uh, demonstrated or not demonstrated certain capabilities. So um, that doesn't really include the cybersecurity test plan. That one is designed a little bit differently just because of the particularities of the cybersecurity analysis. And we also use some open source tools. They are free and open source, so you can download them and use them in your, in your validation processes. And we actually encourage people to use these tools as part of their QA process if you're a vendor or as part of your selection or tendering process if you are an end user. And those are the EBU list, EBU Live IP Software Toolkit, um, and the AMWA NMOS testing tool, test suite that um, AMWA maintains and, and publishes. So at the back, you will see the pyramid. And of course, you will see you, the pyramid outlines how the community sees the, the um, complete ecosystem. And we're happy to say that we, by doing this, we are actually addressing on purpose things that are red and yellowish in the pyramid. And we cover them with the particular pieces of the program, with the particular task plan. So, for example, the NMOS NTR-1001 task plan and the catalog will address 
certain things that are still not quite up to speed as we would like them in the operational control and, and configuration um, and monitoring areas of the pyramid. And of course, the cybersecurity being cybersecurity. So um, just a couple of words about the infrastructure network because it was a, a little bit different this time and, and our colleague Pablo here at the back was, was in charge of that together with the, with the experts from the industry. Uh, we wanted to provide as much as possible the real world scenarios in the network to the best of our extent. Of course, this is a synthetic um, exercise and, and obviously certain compromises had to be made and, and we, we will be looking into those in the future iterations of the program. But we wanted to make a scalable, predictable network that uh, highlights uh, best practices in network design. That's why we went for the routed um, design. So it was a layer three network. Uh, every single, almost every single device was in its own routed port, unless there are certain limitations in the architectural design of the product that they had the dual interface or whatever. Um, so those were in their own separate subnets, the network was dynamically routed um, with a dual resilient uh, PTP design and we also did some, some Grandmaster failover exercises. And overall, we had a spine leaf topology with two spines and 10 leaves, uh, plus some out-of-band management, um, uh, some out-of-band management switches, as well as two dedicated Grandmasters for those failovers in, in an amber and blue network, um, just like the design best practices. And we also had a full-blown network services suite in the, in the network with the DHCP. For all those routed ports, we had 577 scopes in the DHCP. That was quite an exercise to go through. Talk to Pavlo if you want to know more. He will tell you about all that um, involvement in there. And of course, the full-blown NMOS infrastructure with the proper DNSSD. Uh, and uh, the Easy Anmos suite by Richard Hasty from NVIDIA. So if you want actually an easy deployment of the Anmos infrastructure for your lab, an Easy Anmos container has proven to be a reliable uh, solution uh, that is um, easy to deploy, but at the same time, it, it showed that it scales and can support the topologies and, and um, networks of this, of this scale. Uh, in terms of network, we very interestingly, we seen a very interesting move from 10 to 25 gig. A lot of devices that were historically using 10 gigs, we now have much more 25 gigs than 10 gig ports. And also a move from 40 gig to 100 gig. And it seems like the industry is stabilizing around those kind of speeds. So if you're procuring um, device network devices, it may give you a clue that you may want to look into a 25 gig switch rather than 10 gigs just to have this headline for the for the UHD capabilities. And now to talk a little bit about the uh, actual test plans, what we've tested and the results, here is, here's Willem. So uh, thank you, Yevgen. The results, well, it's, it's a lot of results. So actually, maybe to take a step back, why is 25 gig uh, more common these days? We thought about what is the resolution and what's the frame rate we're testing. So actually we thought, Let's focus at UHD P50, right? Event is in Europe, so let's go for P50. And the majority of the pieces of kit that we ran through the test delivered UHD. So this is why the majority of the ports uh, will probably be in the, in the order of 25 gig. Now, we thought about uh, this test uh, again, like, okay, we'll do a repetition of all the things we did before, but we do some minor tweaks and changes. But actually the changes were a little bit more than we expected. And the program was a little bit more successful than we expected. Uh, so if we dig into some numbers, you'll see that there's a lot more devices that showed up that we ran through the test. Now, the catalog starts with uh, a grid you see here on the screen. The grid, it's actually pretty simple to read. On the top, you see all the tests that we did perform and the rows are all the devices that we put through the test. Of course, this is, a, this is just a major, a major effort to go through all these tests. And uh, Mr. Wes Simpson, our host for today, uh, was part of the test. And I was very lucky and honored that he was part of the test and uh, did the first part of those uh, tested catalogs. So let's dive in a little bit further. Um, of course, we did the basic tests. You need to connect the device to the network. 
And uh, usually when we talk to uh, broadcasters, they tell us about, well, maybe you should use DHCP instead of a fixed IP address. So those basic tests, like how do you uh, connect your device to the network, we did test in the basic network test. Also PTP, uh, Pavlo at the back, he tested for uh, PTP uh, details and also IGMP version three, because a lot of installments at broadcasters use P uh, IGMP version three. And when you plug a V2 device, the whole net network drops back to V2. So these are the important network test parts. Of course, there are a few more, but well, that's maybe sufficient uh, to start with. Of course, we, dashed, we tested Dash 20, the video part. Dash 21, which is the C and the VRX and all that good technical stuff to see if the network is compatible. I can uh, bore you later with that, uh, <laughs> with those details. Dash 22, that's a new one. So there's uncompressed with Dash 20 and there's Dash 22 with compressed video. For this case, we particularly looked into compression with JPEG XS. There's Dash 30, the audio. Uh, as the previous speaker mentioned, there's level A, B, C, and uncompressed audio, that's, that is Dash 30. Dash 31, that's another part for audio. Um, Dash, dash 40 ancillary data and of course when you install you want to have a resilient facility so there is dash 7 for the resilience in your facility uh, please do scan the qr code or, or look at the back or be scanned with your badges not for security but, but to get those presentations right um, so we had 35 vendors and that's maybe one more compared to the previous tested event. But some vendors said, okay, we, we know, and they didn't show up for the dash uh, for the 2110 test, but we had new players on the market. This is very interesting. So the program is not only out of interest for old players on the market, but also for new players. We had 84 products to be tested, and that's 140% compared to the last event. So that's a huge amount of more devices that we needed to test in the same amount of time. So you can imagine the stress upon the testing. So out of those uh, 84 products, we had 63 video only, video dedicated uh, products. So maybe they do also audio, but specific uh, video products and 17 audio only devices. Uh, of course, there's a, a, a finer granularity. There are transmitter only devices, receive devices, and also like a vision switcher that could be a transmitter and a receiver at once. And in total, if you look at the amount of uh, uh, stress that I put the testing team through, uh, they ticked 11,000 boxes in the full testing catalog, catalog. This is just for 2110 testing alone. That's an amazing deal. So, Maybe a rough nutshell of what we went through. We, we saw that 67% of the devices, they do already support DHCP. It, it's yellow. You would assume if you're a normal IT user that every device uses DHCP, but actually this is new in our industry, right? Everybody in the past did use fixed IP inst uh, installations and addresses, but it's not normal these days. You should use DHCP, right? Um, DHCP on the media network interface, okay, there's an interesting other thing. When you plug a device, um, you need to be careful if your device is not suddenly becoming the grandmaster of your facility, right? And uh, back in the days when it was uh, first days, uh, <laughs> we were imagining that there may be a little Raspberry Pi that you plug in and suddenly the Raspberry Pi was the grandmaster of the whole facility. So there's something in particular that we tested and very interesting. We see a very good result here. 99% of the devices that we did test have some sort of switch that, you, that they can state, no, we will never assume to be the grandmaster role. So that's a very important test but also a very good result. There's also a very good result uh, for proper PTP TLV messages. I won't bore you with the details, but this can create a broadcast storm in your network. So it's, it's a, this is a very good score. A new test we added, and maybe it's not that harmful that the score is not that good, but if you're a user and you are not aware about IP multicast addresses, and you would happen to use the range 224000, 000, 
then you might end up destroying your network because this is a specific range in which your routing protocols do live and also your PTP does live. So don't use these ranges. So we test the devices to see if a user was able to use those ranges for a multicast setup. 57% uh, prohibits you to use this range. So it's not a blocker, but it's interesting, right? Then there's 100% of the devices using IGMP version 3. That's really green, ticking the box all over the place. But we also digged into the fact it's V3, of course, but does it use source-specific IGMP version 3? Some people do love to use source-specific because then you can uh, be more uh, resilient. So going a little bit further into depth about Dash 10, there's one thing that we were really surprised about that's exposing the SDP file, right? So 2110-20, it is not self-explaining what video is on the wire. So you need to have some sort of a file or something in the network that expresses what is transported over the wire. That's the SDP file. It's mandatory to expose this in whatever way. The standard does not describe how to do it, but you need to expose this. So if you're reading the catalog, be mindful about this detail. We saw a lot of interesting good factors, right? Like producing a valid stream. Almost 100% of the devices do produce a valid stream. So we're way beyond good quality boxes on the market, right? So we see a lot of good improvements. Produce a stream within the boundaries of the VRX limits. There's a small catch here. I say 86%. It looks a bit low, but there are devices which uh, produced IPMX. And IPMX is something pretty similar to 2110, but it doesn't constrain you to the VRX limits. So I should recalculate this value, taking into account that there were IPMX devices on the network. So actually, the result is much better than you see here on this slide. As I mentioned before, we included Dash 22, the compressed version to the test, and 25%, uh, so a quarter of the devices already implement Dash 22 of those devices that we have seen in the test. And that's pretty interesting because if you want to move in higher resolutions, higher speeds, or maybe between campuses, you would like to have Dash 22 for sure. No, no questions asked. For the audio, also very good results. There's a first thing that we tested now with DSCP values. Mm, there's something that you should dig into if you uh, do an installment and be uh, mindful about these things. For the rest, almost 40% uh, applied the tests for Dash 31, 82% for Dash 40. Mm -hmm. For the Dash 7, this, this is something else you need to be very mindful about. If you're building a facility and you're going through the effort of building an Ember and a Blue network, you're paying twice the network, right? Because you want to have a resilient facility. You need to be sure that the products that you will be using in your facility fully support the risk that you're protecting to. So 88%, they demonstrated the capabilities of the Dash 7. So that's 88% of the devices have the possibility to be connected to a resilient network. But if you look into all the details of Dash 7, there are some horrible details, like you can have some jitter on the network, packets dropped out. Those are really horrible tests, but this is stress testing, right? And all of the devices do, go with the basic testing, but when you go into the horrible test, maybe there are some dropouts. So if you went ahead with your devices in a very horrible setup, please be mindful about this. So most of the devices, they, they operate pretty well, but the small details, if you need them, be careful. So maybe I'll give the word back to Yevgen to talk a little bit about the Enmos catalog, or you want me to continue about the Please numbers? continue. I continue. Okay. So. Probably you would have expected to see Felix Poulin here because he's the guy who was driving the NMOS uh, catalog and the NMOS uh, testing. I'm not aware so much into depth like 2110, but I'll try to guide you through the results. And you see something similar, right? We did our uttermost best to give a similar feeling to the catalog and to the tested uh, catalog. So once you understand catalog one, catalog B, it's an easy read through. Well, <laughs> easy read through. So what did we do test the BCP003? 
ISO 4 uh, because you need to register uh, your device on the network and it needs to be discovered. There's connection ma management. Once the devices are on the network, a sender and a receiver need to be connected, right? So that's ISO 5. And once you have these uh, audio uh, running through your network, for instance, you use the level A audio with your eight audio channels and you route your audio channels uh, through a speaker, the speaker needs to know what channel to pick, right? He cannot just play out eight channels. You need to say, oh, pick me seven, the seventh channel to play out. So this, for this, you can use audio channel mapping. There's some uh, further things like uh, ISO 9, um, receiver capabilities with 004, and of course, the NMOS registry tests. So you see a lot more media nodes were presented for NMOS. And this is actually very great. This is why if you look at the pyramid at the back of the room, there is some yellowish. So probably from an EBU point of perspective, we need to review the pyramid because more products are available with NMOS. And this is really beneficial for the user because just with the data plane, it's like a phone without the dialing pad, right? And now you have the phone with the dialing pad, NMOS. So that's very great to see these type of results. 90% uh, did pass the test for ISO 4. Very good, very good results. 8% do receiver capabilities with BCP004, uh, but that's pretty new. So that's normal, uh, but we're on a good path here. Uh, going further, uh, controllers and registries. We just see more products available. So that's very good. This gives us confidence that we can uh, build our facilities with 2110 and NMOS, going the full TR1001 uh, JTNM document way. 94% of the controllers do pass uh, the tests. That's a pretty good number, right? So that might be one out of the whole uh, catalog that does not uh, pass all the tests. For the cybersecurity assessment, well, you probably would expect Gerben here as well. And uh, Yevgen told me Gerben is working pretty hard to get the results done, but he already gave us a sneak preview here. So this is the sneak preview of the automated scanning results. Maybe we won't change the bottom layer of the pyramid as, as a result of our findings. We're on a good way. All the vendors are taking part of those tests. We give the feedback to the vendors, but now seeing that maybe the control layer is getting better, maybe the next thing to do will be improving on the security layer. So I don't know when the result will be published, Yevgen, but it will be pretty soon, I guess. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Willem. Um, the, there will be a separate re report for the cybersecurity, obviously. You may also want to come tomorrow for the cybersecurity presentation. Gerben will be here in the flesh with not so half-baked results, but I really, I, I really virtually hold him and like give me something to show to people because people want to know what's with the security. And then he gave me this. Um, thank you, Gerben. Um, so um, yeah, there will be a, a, a report outlining the state of the state of the industry we were not obviously not going to be publishing individual reports of every single vendor because that's giving keys to your apartment to an outsider um but what is interesting and as as willem said thank you willem for 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 that remark uh, the bottom line is that the security hasn't improved that much unfortunately and this is something that we really want to um, pay attention to. And what is also interesting is this diagram is basically the spread of the security issues found with the particular devices. And you see that there are some devices that are doing a pretty good. There are some devices that are like meh, but there is also quite a quite a few offenders um, that if, if things go bad, they, they go bad. And, and this is something we, we want to look at. So um, we made some early conclusions and outcomes that Jack Douglas from Packet Storm. You, you, can, you can tell him that you've seen him like this. Um, 
it's time for the for the pyramid revision. So the the graphics is on the back. Next time you visit IP Showcase and the trade shows will be different. And we also want to look into making the future testing events more automated and sustainable because getting people uh, in the room for five days, in, not including the installation that takes another five days for the testing teams and for the whole plethora of experts from the industry, taking them off their duties and putting them in this room and saying, you're going to stay here for as long as we are testing is just not okay. And, and we, we need to find a better way to give this information to the community in a more sustainable, repeatable, automatable way so that everyone's time is valued and is also maybe a bit less commute. Um, an extensive Anmos support helped already with the testing. So when um, w the feedback from the testing teams that we've got is that when Anmos was properly implemented and was operating in a device, the data plane testing went much smoother because we were using broadcast controllers to make connections with the reference devices. And when you can just drag and drop instead of typing in IP addresses, everyone's life is just better. So we will be pushing for more support and potentially looking into um, not differentiating anymore between the data plane badge and the, and the control badge. We're going to be looking into maybe an ecosystem badge or something like that. Don't quote me on that because this is all just thinking out loud, this is early conclusions. This is something we may want to look in the future, seeing all this now. Uh, we may need to go into some additional networking and PTP interoperability uh, for, for things like the failovers and things like the behavior in the networks. And as I already said, the cybersecurity situation doesn't seem to be improving um, as fast as we would like to. Gerben, of course, will have more input on this but we need to pay some additional attention to that. And this also um, gives a clue to people who are procuring equipment. If you don't put these requirements, if you don't put pressure on product owners from the vendors, they won't put it on the roadmap. They will prioritize things that the customers are actually asking for. And if you're not asking for HTTPS instead of HTTP, they won't do that because that's always um, an effort and additional costs and development costs, and they need to prioritize. So if the collective community of users will say, we're not going to buy your product unless you implement um, a, a secure login into your web interface, that will give some indications that maybe this is something we want to implement in our products. Um, and um, it's probably, again, too early to say, but I want to be optimistic. We, we want to look into another round of testing, potentially, maybe the final, I don't know, I, I shouldn't say that. Um, but in summer of 2023, 20, uh, uh, somewhere in Europe, uh, we will look into doing that again, again, in a much more sustainable and repeatable fashion, maybe with much more preparations in terms of self-testing and pre-testing and a lot of education around the um, execution of the tests for both the testing teams and the vendors. And um, thank you very much. This is the, um, this is, uh, I should say, most of the team. I, I actually, when I was putting this picture, I noticed that a couple of face were, faces were missing from this picture. But this is the team behind. This is the testing infrastructure team, part of the experts team that made this possible, that went there in this uh, not so cramped, actually pretty spacious room at, at Riedel in Wuppertal and um, delivered this, these results for you. So massive thank you on behalf of the team to the users and to the vendors who participated. You made it possible and hopefully the community will benefit from the efforts and we will continue making this um, available for, for you all. And uh, thank you very much for listening.